This podcast is brought to you by Craft Spirits and Distilling for those who make and drink great spirits. Join our free email newsletter for technical and creative distilling stories in your inbox every week. Learn more at spiritsanddistilling.com. Hi, guys. This is the Craft Spirits and Distilling podcast. My name is Sydney Jones. We're on episode number three this week, talking to master distiller Lisa Wicker, a good personal friend of mine. We're going to get into how she came about to be a master distiller from a winemaking uh, job that she kind of stumbled into. Talk a little bit about her work with heirloom corn varieties, which is super interesting. Her blending philosophies and then what's new for her and what's coming down the road for her. But before we get into all of that, Say goodbye to the complexities of ordering equipment and supplies from multiple vendors and say hello to the efficiency and simplicity offered by Lotus Beverage Alliance. This new alliance brings together craft beverage industry powerhouses, GW Kent, Alpha Brewing Operations, Stout Tanks and Kettles, Twin Monkeys Beverage Solutions, Brewmation, and Automated Extractions to provide an unrivaled portfolio of craft beverage equipment and supplies. Experience the convenience of working with one vendor, one source, for all of your craft business needs. Visit lotusbevalliance.com now and start streamlining your process today. And Country Malt Group is proud to support craft distillers across North America with a carefully curated portfolio of the best everyday ingredients and supplies, including malt, adjuncts, fruit, yeast, and more. Visit countrymalt.com slash distilling to view their complete list of distilling products, resources, and podcast episodes. Lisa, thank you so much for agreeing to record with me. Sydney, I'm so excited that you're in Bardstown. I love for people to come visit here. And um, I love showing off Bardstown a little bit. Is I tell people it's like being in Napa Valley. It right? is amazing here. I am obsessed. I hope to live here one day. Um, it is beautiful. It feels like a storybook. Uh, and I'm very jealous that you live like on the main drag of Bardstown. It's such a like dream small little southern town it is it is yeah i still it's still a little surreal for me some days because they used to call third street um distillers row there were so many distillers that lived on third street now i think it's down to me my next door neighbor and fred and freddie no i think <laughs> i think that's, I mean, that's still, still <laughs> quite the like heavy hitter lineup that you've got there so <laughs> your definition of that kind of cracks me up a little bit uh, but can you tell our listeners a little bit about your career, where you started, just for people who are not aware of your background, and they should be because you're an absolute rock star. So, oh, I appreciate that. You know, I, you know, it's, you it's funny. It's always, like I said, it's a little surreal sometimes. You know, I just love what I do very much. But um, I am the mother of three kids. I was raising three kids, working in the arts. And on a crazy whim, I had two kindergarten moms who worked in a winery um, that asked me to come. Um, They couldn't find anybody to harvest grapes. And they said, you seem like the type that would like to harvest grapes. So I started doing that. And um, I was running a costume shop for a um, tiny professional dance company. And then we were also costuming some other dance companies in an underserved arts area in southeastern Indiana. And um, we laughed the whole time. It was hard work. We it was dirty and sticky and all the things, right? But then I started um, asking the winemaker all kinds of questions. And um, somebody that I had known for years, we sold grapes to. And he, I had known him for years and years. We'd moved back to the area um, about uh, maybe five years before all of this and um, the area that I grew up in, it was about an hour from there. And he had been calling me to come to work for him in another winery, right? And Or he had actually been asking me every time I was in there. And one day he calls me, He we show up with the grapes. He calls me, he's like, what are you doing, right? You know, I want you to come to work for me. And I told him yes, without thinking it through. I found somebody to take over the costume shop that had a um, textile degree from University of Illinois. She's still running it all these 20 some years later um, and went to work for him. And three days in, I knew that's what I was supposed to be doing. I was working in production with him, the winemaker and his son. And it was the three of us for um, the eight years that I was there and um, was fortunate, like in the third week that I was there, that Ellie Butts, she was a Purdue professor that then went on to work with Lala Manese, saw something in me and um, was my mentor. The man that trained me to make wine was 
crazy smart, right? And um, had been a winemaker at another winery in Indiana that um, just is, I think, ranked in the top 29 wineries in the United States for volume. They make almost a million gallons of wine in Southern Indiana of all places. And so anyway, so my connection there got, got, you know, and anyway, I just didn't look back. That's amazing. And for you guys who might not be familiar, Lalamond yeast, Lalamond, they're Mm -hmm. a huge um, bio lab. They produce uh, yeast, not only for uh, distilleries who are making beverage alcohol, but also like fuel ethanol and all sorts of other things. And uh, they're really incredible. Shout out Lalamond. I use their yeast. Yeah, yeah. Um, really love working with them. Uh, but yeah, great source there. So yeah, de- definitely one of the gold standards, right? But for sure, I started trying to patch my education together as quick. You know, I was still had, you know, two kids at home at that point, and um, I did every intensive I could at University of California Davis. I'd pack up and go out for their intensives and and filtration and um, fermentation and finishing and. Um, during that time too, I would just at, you know, Purdue University had put a viticulture program together. So I was working with them. I was working a little bit out of Cornell and a little bit out of Virginia Tech. I was just patching everything together as I could go. Um, and, you know, one thing led to another and I was offered a job to come to Kentucky to build a winery because winery, Kentucky actually has a really old wine tradition. Um, it was one of the third or fourth largest wine producing state in the United States before Prohibition. Uh, So even like Maker's Mark, when it was Brook Springs Distillery, has ads for because they were also making blackberry. They're making fruit wines, too. They're making blackberry wine. Um, And so you see some, if you go through to the old Kentucky distillery records, you'll see a lot of distilleries that were making brandy Mm. in addition to whiskey before Prohibition. So Prohibition wipes out the wine industry because, um, you know, the vineyards weren't tended to all those years. Um, You know, fast forward, um, the... Department of Ag in Kentucky was giving incentive money for people to get out of tobacco growing and into another cash crop. And so some of that incentive money was specifically earmarked for grapes. That's so interesting because Kentucky still grows so much tobacco. Yes. Like you see it when you drive through the countryside. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's a romantic, very romantic. Crop. It is. It is a beautiful thing to yeah. see it growing in the countryside. Yeah. Uh, but it is really interesting with that, the, you know, um, tobacco smoking culture. Yeah, and that is definitely, it's still very much alive and well in Kentucky. It is. It is very much so. So, um, but they didn't do the best job in the whole world coordinating which grapes grew the best in uh, Kentucky versus which um, grapes winemakers wanted to use. So I built a distillery and, um, or distillery, a winery in Calvary, Kentucky. I was working out of a retrofitted barn first, and then we built a building. Um, and I was working there during that time. I met Steve Beam from Limestone Branch. Um, the owners of the winery went through a very spectacular divorce, and <laughs> I saw the writing on the wall, and I figured it was probably going to go down, and it did. Um, but I had booked a ticket to Sonoma because I thought this was in the spring, and I thought I have got to get out there and see if I can find a position for the fall just for harvest, and then I'll come back to Kentucky and regroup. My youngest had started college. And so I booked the ticket, and Paul and Steve, I resigned the winery, and Paul and Steve Beam took me to dinner 24 hours after I resigned the winery and offered me a full-time position. Wow. So I'd already been helping out in the evenings there at Limestone Branch, and so they um, accelerated my whole plan because I really wanted to learn to distill, but I always thought I'd be distilling brandy, right? I thought it was- I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. I'd worked my way onto the legislative committee to um, change the law to get stills a um, into wineries here and did never have to follow through with that because of moving over to distillation as fast as I did. Such is life. I, yeah. as someone who stumbled into distillation, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of how it just goes yeah. sometimes. It, very much so. How many people like started in tasting rooms or they started because, you know, they were the bartender at the distillery and somebody didn't, sh- somebody went AWOL, right? You know, it's like, can you step in today and help me out, right? And be your extra set of hands. And the next thing you know, they're the distiller, right? Well, and it really reinforces the belief that I have always had and something that few spirits in particular fosters is that. You don't have to have necessarily a technical degree to be an outstanding distiller. Sometimes it's these people that they're artists, they are musicians, they are teachers uh, that come at distilling with such a unique lens and it makes them such a better operator within that space and they can create really incredible things. Yeah, I'm always amazed how many people came from the arts. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, but I I tend to say the um, the worst thing that ever happened to me is I don't have a chemical engineering degree. And the best thing that ever happened to me is I don't have a chemical engineer. <laughs> because I, 
don't use those rules hard and fast, right? You know, because of that, I've always been able to bend the rules a little bit. It's like, oh yeah, I know what I know what point the water boils. I know what point the alcohol comes over. But but <laughs> exactly. But how about this, right? Um, mash cooking. You know, I've developed my own protocol over the years, and it's a lot slower and a lot colder than a traditional um, mash, but. You know, I discovered that it wasn't throwing as much corn oil and the corn oil wasn't burning in the still. And so we were getting a lot prettier product and um, a better alcohol yields too. Yeah, let's talk about that. Tell us a little bit about this kind of cold mashing principle because, you know, the tradition has been you boil your hard grains like mm-hmm. corn first, you boil the hell out of them right. to get that starch conversion. Right. Um, and then you lower your temperature, you add your malt, your rye, your wheat, your softer grains, and then you let that sit for a little bit. And then you mm-hmm. crash that down right. and add your yeast and bing, bing, bang, there's your your distiller's beer, you yes. know? So your methodology, though, is very different. It is. It's like, don't, don't start the corn and t- I'm about 194, 195, mm-hmm. right? Um, not de- Never over 200. Um, mm-hmm. Hold time's a little bit longer. Um it works best for heirloom corn. Yeah. And part of the reason, so I stumbled on it by accident. I, you know, after Limestone Branch, um, I got fired from Limestone Branch uh, because Lexco purchased them. And so I was the number two guy. And, you know, they replaced me with a guy from St. Louis. But then Ted Huber picked me up at Starlight. Mm-hmm. I'd known him for years because they have a winery there. And um, he'd added a grain distillery. Um, so I ended up, um, you know, distilling for him and we were using nothing but heirloom grain. And on one particular day, I had too many irons in the fire and I'm in the distillery by myself. And I realized that I have not set the timer on my phone in my back pocket. I haven't, um, I let the temperature drop in the cooker. And so I've got two things. I have no idea how long it's been held, but I know it's way too long mm-hmm. and the temperature is way too cool. And I get the best conversion I've ever had. And I'm like, what in the world? And so I, it's, you know, old winemaker, I use a refractometer for sugar, right? And mm-hmm. so I'd taken it to Tad and he goes, what am I looking at? And I'm like, I said, I just effed everything up. And <laughs> this is what I've got. And, here and I said, I want you to come back with me because I'm not believing this, right? And so he comes back with me and we're looking at it. It's like, holy cow. But then I discovered it T- tasted better when it was distilled because um, you'll see in heirloom corn specifically, you'll see all of this kind of neon colored corn oil that tends to settle in on the top. When you cook it colder and longer, it doesn't separate like that. Interesting. So you don't get that waxy, burnt, a lot of heirloom um, whiskeys, you'll get that waxy, burnt kind of taste to it, right? That's kind of off a little bit. Yeah. And this keeps that from happening. Yeah. You know? For those who might not be aware, when we're talking about hold times and when we're talking about times when you're mashing, so you you add your grains in at various temperatures. We call them strike temperatures. Uh, And in many cases, you're adding in certain enzymes as well, like an alpha amylase uh, to help with liquefaction and gelatinization and things of this nature. So a hold time is how long you hold the grain at that temperature. Um, And you don't want to hold it there like right, there is right. a limit yes. for how long yeah. that grain well, especially is. when you're trying to you know get 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 a cook done exactly a reasonable work day yeah. you can't be there for 12 <laughs> hours doing a cook you know we have lives outside of this uh but that's super super interesting you're talking about all this oil that's sitting on the top um in my mind when i hear of oil i automatically think of flavor mm-hmm. so you're talking a little bit about these burnt flavors carrying through distillation what are some other flavors that you can directly correlate to this like different mashing protocol well, you think i don't know specifically because heirloom corn you know heirloom corn is the flavor grain so when you're talking about traditional bourbons you're talking about a high rye or a weeded a mash bill. Yeah, these traditional flavoring grains that yes, we, exactly. we define bourbon as. Exactly. But with, with heirloom corn, the heirloom corn is the flavor grain. Mm-hmm. So you're trying to balance that out and not override it. So like, um, you know, with the Widow Jane project, I moved from regular rye to malted rye because it's a softer softer profile than the rye was with it, and it was not overpowering it. So malted rye and uh, malted barley. Uh, a person you and I know well, um, he comes to me and he's looking at the you know the cost of running barrels, right? And he's like, 
So explain to me again why we're using this malted rye, because so-and-so tells me that the regular rye is a lot less expensive. And I'm like, well, number one, it's only 10% of our mash bill. But number two, it's that, I said, it's that heavy cream note that you like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he goes, oh, okay, okay. Okay, it's fine. We can justify that. <laughs> we can cost. justify that. The bar yeah. Barrel cost is fine, right? But Malting grain is, is so interesting to me because we associate so much malted grain with malted barley, mm -hmm. but you have things like malted rye. And I just heard a really interesting presentation on malted corn yes, that yes. Todd Leopold is doing yes. out in Colorado, yes. which is apparently a pain to do, but is producing some really cool flavors. And I think this new horizon- I'm a Todd Leopold groupie. Oh my God, <laughs> me too. Todd, if you're yes. listening to this, you and I yeah. text already, but I love you. Uh, <laughs> but- it's just interesting to see kind of this progression that we've made with grains in the industry. Um, you know, we've always associated with bourbon with, you know, your standard yellow dent, and then you've got your red winter wheat, and then you've got your rye, and mm -hmm. it's probably from Canada, and that's it, <laughs> you know? And now we're exploring all of these new different avenues of grain. You know, you're seeing all these different grains that are being malted, and now you're seeing heirloom corn, and you've done such cool work specifically with heirloom corn. And that's a grain that I haven't gotten my hands on too much, so... Walk me through kind of the process of evaluating an heirloom corn because there's so many out there. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it could get overwhelming sometimes. So really, that's all on any scale that I've ever distilled. When we, I was at Limestone Branch, um, we had an heirloom white. Um, it had like a name like tri there's two or three, you know, so as heirlooms do, they tend to have different names in different regions because they're different strains a little bit. And I think it was Trucker's Preference that we were using there, but a really soft white corn. Mm. Um, and it was lovely, right? And we were pot distilling it. It was really, really good. I didn't have anything to bounce that off of. You know, I didn't have, you know, after coming for straight from wine, I didn't have um, a baseline, you know, on what that was specifically supposed to be, other than the fact that I, you know, knew what good whiskey tastes like, right? But we were making a lot of moonshine too out of that corn. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to get like a really straight profile, you know, flavor profile on it because there was no other added grains. It was just corn and sugar, right? So yeah. sugar whiskey. And then with Ted Huber, we were going, you know, they've got 700 acres that they did at the time. I think they're close to a thousand acres now, but they had, um, a white, a red, and a blue. So we had Bloody Butcher, which a lot of people are making whiskey out of and using for culinary reasons. And then we had a Hopi Blue, but there's a whole bunch of different strains of Hopi Blue, right? So many different ones. Yes. And some of them distill really well and some of them not so great. And then we had a white, same thing, but it was a numbered varietal. Um, and, um, you know, so we actually made a red, white, and blue. <laughs> it's very patriotic. <laughs> very patriotic. We love it. Yeah, we did. We were doing a lot of four grain there. Mm -hmm. um, but so it was so interesting, too, to go back to back to back with the different, three different corns, right? The three different heirloom corns and see which things were, you know, a little bit starchier in flavor, a little bit waxier, a little bit, you know, um, fruitier, mm -hmm. right? And we were able to um, work through that. But heirloom corn, there's lots of things that differentiate it from yellow dent other than just the color and the flavor. A lot of heirloom corns, too, don't make good whiskey, right? Yeah. Just because it's pretty doesn't mean it's going to make good whiskey. Right? Yeah, the carotene content yes. can really affect yes. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and the chlorophyll. Like, I had a beautiful green that was presented to me one time, and I didn't even ever distill it because I made cornbread out of it. And it tasted like a like I was chewing on you know fresh cut grass or something right. I was like, this is not going to distill over very well. So, um, tips for distillers: <laughs> make cornbread oh, yeah, with do. your heirloom varietals before you make it into I whiskey. I do because you heat it and you can tell so I much mean, about it. It's brilliant. And who doesn't love cornbread? <laughs> yeah, you could either cook it into grits or cornbread or something like that. But just heating it and adding water to it, you can kind of start to understand what the flavor is going to be, right? And like, no, this is like. Too it's gorgeous. It was like emerald green. It looked like jewels, you know. So I really wanted to make a whiskey out of it. I just couldn't. So, um, but heirloom corn, because of the everything from standability to the way that it's presented on the stock, right? Everything's been, uh, all the hybrids have been um, developed so that it's easier to harvest, mm -hmm. right? All If you look at um, a hybrid a yellow dent cornfield, you'll see that all the ears of the corn are all start, you know, several feet from the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's so the harvester can get in there and the combine can get in there and just go right below all of that. And they don't waste a single ear of corn. Yeah. Way, right. The corn industry is all about 
Efficiency. Yes. Efficiency and yield. Yes. And so yes. to bring in um, heirlooms, everything is not about efficiency. <laughs> it's all about flavor. So um, we with Widow Jane, we grew, um, you know, a really, so it moved from um, Starlight to, you know, end up working at Widow Jane and they'd already trademarked an open pollinated cross of uh, Wapsie Valley and Bloody Butcher. Um, I brought that to scale here in Kentucky with um, Peterson Farms, Bernard Peterson, who's still a friend of mine through all of these projects. And um, even with me not being in there longer, I am understanding that he's growing um, Baby Jane again this year. So I'm thrilled to hear that project is continuing. But um, Baby Jane being the heirloom yes, thank you. whiskey project that you started at yeah. Widow Jane. Yes. At- I actually inherited it. I just blew it up. Oh, I mean, yes, yes. No, Michelle had already worked on that, you know, with the farmer and everything. Yeah. And they had the seed corn. They just didn't have it blown up. They'd actually had a few thousand bushels in storage. And so they were going to destroy it when I first started. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, can I, let me go look at it. Let me go check it. So I go out to the, um, the silos and they're in the middle of nowhere, right? And, but, it's immaculate. Like the the grounds are immaculate. There's not a stray kernel of corn. There's not a piece of gravel out of place. They were brand new silos. I tested it. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so we brought that back to Kentucky to distill because there was we didn't have the capacity in New York to do that or the team at that time that could handle that. So um, brought it all back and ran that here. Um, t- so also so I could get my head around what it's going to taste and look like. Yeah. Um, and you know we made some mistakes early on with temperatures and some things, right? Because we're going to somebody else's house to do this to cook yeah. it, right? So um, you know we hadn't um, dialed in what we where we needed to be exactly with that, but gave us a good idea before we started to grow on a much larger scale. So here. Um, like up, so we were growing up in upstate New York, and all the upstate New York corn was going to Brooklyn for us to distill in Brooklyn. Yeah, Widow Jane is based out of Brooklyn, mm-hmm. out of Red Hook. So yes, you guys yes. are distilling some Baby Jane there as well as working on other Widow Jane products. Yes, which we'll talk about more later. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, so you brought that big batch back to Kentucky to distill. Yes, yeah. right. And so then you know we're growing upstate. I found a farmer upstate New York to produce the um because they were trying to grow in Pennsylvania, but that would take away all of the perks of having, you know, a New York New York product. And so found that farmer. He's still growing for them. And then we used the seed farmer then in Pennsylvania because the uh, farmer in upstate New York was also growing seed because it was a one of kind crop. So, you know, hail, locust, acts of God, we could have lost our seed crop. Mm-hmm. So two states made more sense. And so then we're um growing that back here. But the Average yield on that stuff was we normally like 57 to 63 bushels an acre. And here we were pushing 80 to 83 bushels an acre. Nice. Because of the agronomists um, weighing in, because of Peterson Farms knowing what they're doing, uh, lots of experimental plots, lots of different elevations, lots of different exposures mm-hmm. with different plots. Um, Bernard said he didn't know so many people were watching his corn crop until they called him and said, "This something's wrong with your corn this year. <laughs> Because the heirloom corn stalks, they have standability issues, but the, also the ears of corn could be really close to the ground yeah. and they could be really top to the top and all the stalks are different sizes and it's just a wild mess, right? And so anyway, but he said, I had no idea so many people were watching out after me until, I, we, until we started doing that. But sure enough, you know, we start working on harvest and um, they have to change the combine out so they can harvest lower, lower and closer to the ground. The problem with that is we were picking up debris. So trying to learn to use heirloom corn on a large scale was a steep learning curve because coming in super sacks and things, you know, it was a little bit easier to handle and we didn't have all the big issues that we had um, um, with cleaning and things that we did on the larger scale. So we're, anyway, we're bringing that back here Um you know, messing up some, uh, let's just say we were messing up some milling equipment somewhere. <laughs> I did get called. That's someone else's headache. <laughs> yes, I did get called to New York. It's just like, can you come back to Kentucky? Because you got, we got to talk, right? And so I went, I flew back to Kentucky and we sat down and we're like, how are we going to get through this? And so the hammer milling, the hammer in. <laughs> it was a roller mill. Oh, we, God. We trashed. But, um, yeah, it's like, it's you know, how are we going to do this, right? So we're going to have to clean it going into the silos, and it's going to have to be clean coming back out again, right? Mm-hmm. So that we can uh, eliminate some of that debris. But um, breakage is, starts to get old. We learned, you know, I started to learn flavor profile while that I liked the corn a lot better after it had hardened off after three months, four mm-hmm. months old. I didn't like distilling it before 
It's too fresh, too green. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And then actually had a pretty long shelf life on it because, you know, um, Peterson Farms is so good about um, taking care of it. But we really pushed the envelope during COVID because, you know, we had some delays during that time and we kept holding on to the corn, checking the corn quality. Um, and actually, it's like, like some of that whiskey best through that time with the it, corn that had a little bit of age on it. It's so interesting and it really reinforces the idea in my mind that a lot of other distillers, and I know you share as well, whiskey is agriculture. Yes, value-added agriculture. It really is. is. And agriculture is hard and it involves a lot of troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. Ask any farmer, but whiskey is agriculture. It's agriculture that we drink and we enjoy quite a bit, but at at its core, that is what it is. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So before we get into more of our conversation, is your brewery, distillery, or heck, we'll say it, brew distillery, looking for better control of production, finance, compliance, inventory, supply chain, etc.? You want a system that untaps your potential and future-proofs your strategy. You need total visibility into every aspect of your business, and you need it on demand. Visit craftederp.com to learn how Crafted meets you where you are today and prepares you for everything that's coming tomorrow craftederp.com. And craft the perfect blend every time by enhancing the flavor profile of your spirits with Technoblend's state-of-the-art blending and batching technology. Technoblend is the trusted partner of distilleries across the country, providing solutions for unparalleled accuracy and consistency in the distilled spirits production process. Visit technoblend.com today to discover how their innovative solutions can redefine the art of distillation. Technoblend, blend the best. So, Lisa, you talked a little bit at the beginning about your background as a winemaker. So I have this interesting philosophy that every beverage alcohol maker, they have a trash alcohol. And this (laughs) is a very controversial uh, opinion that I have. Um, and this is an alcohol that you drink when you don't want to think about what you're drinking. You don't want to analyze it. You don't care, like how good or bad it may be. It could be very cheap. It's just what you drink to have a good time and relax and rewind. Uh, so wine is that for me. Wine is my trash alcohol. I, I buy purposefully very, very cheap wine and I love it. It's my favorite thing. Uh, ask my fiance. He sees me drink quite a few of, of those bottles. Uh, so tell me a little bit as a distiller who does not have any knowledge of winemaking, and that's a very purposeful choice in my life so I can enjoy my trash alcohol. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Um, what are some interesting like lessons that winemaking taught you from the scientific side that you've translated into a career of whiskey making? Oh, cleanliness. Absolutely, right? You mm-hmm. know, his beer, beer and wine have to be so clean. So clean, right? So clean. And it's, it's an advantage for whiskey to be so clean, mm-hmm. but you can not be as clean with whiskey and still kind of get by with it. Um, the varietal part. So translating into heirloom corn, the fact that the corn might all have different characteristics rather than be all the same as yellow dent, right? And so being able to identify that, being able to, you know, um, pick up on the nuances between different types of yeah. corn. Um, but also the fact that all of those um, varietals had to be handled handled differently, right? You know, we didn't make white wine the way we made red wines. Red wines we fermented, you know, uh, as grapes, right? Before yeah. we press those off. White wines we'd press the juice before, you know, we before we fermented it. So every single grape had to be looked at in a different way with a different yeast, with a different flavor profile. What are we trying to pull out of it? You know, is there enough tannin? Because, you know, one of the little tricks of the trade is to actually add real tannin to grapes if they're not tannic enough mm. um, in, in the pressing process. And so, um, you know, all of those things like, okay, we've got this really wonderful grape. What can we do up front to make it even better on the t- on the back end of things, right? So, um, so it translated into heirloom corn really well uh, because – and actually to even different types of whiskey because – I don't approach it like one size fits all. Yeah. You know, it's like this corn needs this and this corn needs that. And, you know, we're going to make rye whiskey. So we're going to handle it a little bit differently. Let's look at malt whiskey. You know, that's not going to be the same process. You know, what what are we going to do? What How are we, we going to handle it? What kind of yeast are we looking at? What kind of enzymes are we looking at? 
Um, well, and what I'm hearing a lot as well is you're doing a lot of forecasting mm-hmm. for your, for your specific spirit. Mm-hmm. And I was always taught um, from a blending perspective that blending at its core is really just forecasting Mm -hmm. as well. And you have made such a name for yourself as such like a dynamic, incredible blender. So tell me a little bit about your blending philosophy, how you got into blending, how you created these skills that you have and really fun blends that you've worked on. Um, It came from winemaking. So the winemaker that trained me was brilliant, but he was over it, right? (laughs) So we so, all get over it sometimes. <laughs> so he he just told me one day, he goes, just go into the lab and start tinkering, you know, and he, he um, challenged me with a rosé. He goes, I just don't like the rosé. Let's, you know, let's focus on that and see what we can come up with. Let's find something that's a little bit more merchantable that we have. Um, a lot of those wines, we fermented them all to dryness uh, because of the market. Lots of them had to be back sweetened, right? And so that was also his own challenge because, you know, you're like, blend it as all dry wines, you know, zero residual sugar, only you're adding sugar back in at the end. So during that time, I even learned to taste sugar differently, right? Because cane sugar doesn't taste like beet sugar, beet sugar tastes like vegetables. It's true. Yes. And so, you know, um, cotton candy sugar, I'm big, I love, I love um, Belgian candy sugar for brewing. Mm. I love using that to back sweeten products. I've used that in in spirits too. Yeah. I've used Panella, the South American sugar. Um, and really like that. It's so raw. It creates such kind of like this cool viscosity in the spirit. Yes. Uh, yes. It's a fun one for sure. You can almost have to treat sugar almost like a botanical mm-hmm. in its own mm-hmm. right. Like it really is. It's not just adding sweetness. It's adding body. It's adding um, other little flavor notes that you might not anticipate. Yes. And that's the reason I love brewer sugar or Belgian candy sugar because it you taste it and it's not, it looks like a piece of hard candy, right? And you pop it into your mouth and it's like you're expecting that hard candy kind of melting thing going on, but it's not there. The texture's different, but also it's not as concentrated sweetness. It's got a different kind of, so dark, you know, dark Belgian sugar, light Belgian sugar. Um, but in winemaking, it was pretty much either using um, cotton candy sugar or, um, or cane sugar, right, to back sweeten some of them. So anyway, so you're making, you're working on this blend and like, okay, you've got it completely balanced when it's all dry. And then you start to back sweeten and the balance is off. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I really learned how to stay on top of it. And it's like, okay, this isn't good enough. I just killed some of the flavor in it because I had to back sweeten or I actually enhanced maybe a cherry note. Maybe I enhanced a rose petal note, right? You know, so it's like, that's when I started playing. It's like, wow, this is crazy. It's crazy what I could make pop, mm-hmm. you know, or dull down, you know, it's like, oh, I just that that's not what I had in my head that that was going to taste like, right? I put yeah. these things together and it's like, no, that's not right. So I went on to, you know, white wines and then red wines from there. So, and I run to the uh, women in the tasting room all the time until they would start to hide behind the counter when they saw <laughs> <laughs> because- Usually I try to present it to him like, okay, which one is your favorite and which one is most merchantable? And so mostly the, their very favorite one wasn't the most merchantable. And so that one too, you know, always had to feel like you had to, you know, it's like, ah, darn, you know, yeah, this maybe isn't the best expression, but, you know, we got to keep a roof over all of our heads, right? So there's that reality. Mm-hmm. Something I run up against sometimes with craft distilleries is people have set, I'm not going to do that, not going oh, to do God. that. I'm like, okay, yeah. that's great. That's fine. And if you could be successful by just putting the blinders on and not looking at any kind of products that maybe is aren't your favorite, but you can still have a lot of pride in and and stand behind, right? Because they're excellent quality products. But it's like, no, I'm not, go- I'm not going into that category. Yeah, right? it's really interesting. I, there's this like t-shirt slash like hat that I've seen bartenders wear quite a bit. And it applies so much to craft distilleries and large distilleries as well that have these kind of brands in their portfolio. And it says vodka pays the bills. Yes. <laughs> because it does. Yes, it uh, does. <laughs> as soul crushing yes. as it might be <laughs> to distill, just because, you know, it's a neutral spirit. Right. And we all like the things that come off the still with really intense, fun flavors that you get to piece apart in your brain and on your palate. Vodka does, it pays the bills, yes, man. Does. Yeah. Yes, it does. I always tell people, it's like, okay, if you're going to start a distillery, you either have a craft distillery, you either have more money than God, mm. or you... Um, source and blend, or you've, you know, you distill white product to keep your cash flow up because 
even if you have as much, you know, more money than God, you still got to have ca- the accountants are telling you, you still got to have some cash flow, right? You yeah. Know? So no, but it's a reverse pyramid scheme. You just keep putting your money out the door, right? And it keeps building and building and building out the door. But so you've got to have something coming back in, right? To be realistic. Also, it gives you a good chance to start, you know, working, honing on your your blending skills, right? Whether you're working on a gin or- And distillation. I mean, you've got to be really good to make a very good vodka. Yes. Uh, Yes. That's a hard thing to do to make a high quality vodka. Same with gin. God, I made so much gin earlier in my career and I still to this day love it so much. But the gin that I made when I was distilling in Florida took me two years (laughs) to make and just so much trial and error. And there's this- misconception that clear spirits don't take as much time or effort right, to make right. as brown and that could not be further from no, the truth. No, because there's no place to hide. No, exactly. <laughs> All of your faults are just going to be out there. There's yes. nothing that a barrel is going to yeah. do to fix them. I don't think he'll mind t- me telling this, but when I was distilling for Ted Huber, we distilled vodka, right? And it was best in class ACSA, right? But it had a little bit of body and things to it, right? And mm-hmm. we were, I, I actually... For a nod vodka drinker, I like enjoyed sipping it because it had a little bit of backbone and a little bit of body, even though it was and Ted comes to me one day and goes, You gotta strip it more. I'm like, what? He goes, My family, the vodka drinker was like, No, it's got <laughs> <laughs> you can't clash with like the cranberry juice, right? You know, it's like, dang it, you know. So I had to go back and had to um strip that vodka again. It's like my favorite, right? And your soul just died. <laughs> It did. The slow did. suffocation yeah, of your family own did soul. not, or, or whoever the people that were complaining about it were not impressed. They were <laughs> best in class ACSA on that one. Yeah. No, we want thinner. <laughs> we want an yes. ice cold knife going down our throat <laughs> yeah. when we're drinking I, this. I, I, I do remember the day well because I know he hated telling me that I had to go back and do it over. Right. <laughs> But it's a great point that, you know, as distillers, we're not making the alcohol that we want to drink. You are making alcohol that other people want to drink yes, and yes. that will give you a paycheck so you can live in a house. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, eat food. Yes. Yeah. Important. You got to and you got to balance it all, right? So, you know, it's all a game in a good way, right? It's all a chess game. But... The Game of Thrones. <laughs> the Game of Bottles. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so the blending method that I was kind of taught was kind of this pyramid um, methodology of like top, middle, and base notes. Is that something that you subscribe to or do you kind of go about blending in a different way? Um, it depends on what I what the blending project is. So if it's a blending project that's just a one-off, right, it's you, you can just cherry pick everything that you want, right, and work work on that blend. If it's something that has longevity, right, and it's going to be in the market for a long time, I'm looking for through notes. So knowing that like if you're sourcing and blending or you're making your own whiskey and it's all coming out a little bit different. In fact, I prefer it that way, right? Because you've got a lot more things that you can pick from the pantry than if you're, it's all t- tasting very similar. But you're look, I'm looking for that through line. Like, how am I going to establish that? How I'm going to keep that so that the customer, if they do decide they like the product, isn't going to be disappointed the next time. So I lay in bed a lot awake (laughs) saying, okay, (laughs) there's this many barrels of this. What if can we buy more of this down the road? If not, where am I going to start to taper those barrels off that I have the most of right now in that age category? Where am I going to taper those off? So when I'm looking at the blend, I'm not looking at my bench top Mm -hmm. right then, right? I am trying to go backwards to where is that whiskey coming from? How much more of this does this client have? How much more of this my employer has? Um, How, you know, okay, so, you know, the what one I'm best known for, you know, looking for those cherry notes and those baking spice notes and everything else was kind of. Um, but we had to settle into that, right? At first, it's like, oh my gosh, I've got all this great whiskey and um, was making some decent blends, but they were not um, identifiable from one to the next, right? It was like, oh no, you know, I, I wanted people to say, oh yeah, this is, doesn't taste like the last bottle, but I know that this is this brand, right? And uh, so working on that, and it's like, okay, well, then I can start to bring, I'm going to name names here. When I spill the tea. Yes. What, what I, so I'm going to go backwards and then I'll go forward or, uh-huh. or forwards and then I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Stephen Kaplan, he starts helping it. Widow Janie's like, Lisa, 
you got shout to harv- out Steve. He's got he goes, you gotta harvest the whole barrel. But you're like, but I don't want to harvest the whole barrel. <laughs> Stephen Kaplan <It's> like- <laughs> was head distiller at Few Spirits before yes. before yeah. my time. He yes. was also operations manager at Few. He's now um in New York, and he works alongside with Widow Jane's team. Yes, yes, um, we yes. love Steve. Yes, oh, and we oh, we all love him, right? You know, but he's like, I did put my foot down because he's like, he's he's so sweet, he's so convincing, right? It's like you, Lisa, you've got to harvest the whole. Barrel. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna harvest the whole barrel. That's that goes against my whole blending philosophy because <laughs> I like to use heavier extracted barrels like vanilla extracted a cake, right? Mm-hmm. So, and and in order to establish those through lines, you might only want to use a little bit at a time, right? Yeah. So that if this, something's really intense, it doesn't take very much of it to influence, you know, a five barrel blend or a three barrel blend or a seven barrel blend or even 11 or tw- even 23 barrels sometimes, right? So it's like, if I put the whole thing in, it was going to overpower it um, and it'd be too much, but a little bit, just like vanilla extracted a cake goes a long way. And so some of those some of those barrels I'd like to harvest and set aside in 55 gallon drums mm-hmm. so that they can be drawn down that way. I think that was finally how we decided to. The only problem I, I he, he was trying to convince me to do that. I'm like, but then they're not going to continue to age in the barrels. <laughs> and that's true. Yeah. Uh, right. So the longer a yeah. whiskey yeah. is sitting in the barrel, yes. yeah. even if it's a neutral barrel, yes. a barrel that doesn't have like a discernible right. char layer right. to really pull fresh flavor yes. from, you're still getting these really beneficial mm-hmm. oxidative effects. Absolutely. Yeah. And so Stephen was always right. He was al- always ultimately right, but it's like, nope, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, that's so I then I work backwards from that. Right. Okay. Now you can start, you know, now I can start to say, okay, this has got to be this much percentage of the blend. I have to work with this because this is the stock that I'm working off of. If I'm going to, and sometimes it's not what I wanted, right? It's like, okay, yeah. 50% of it has got to be this. And, you know, and so you're, and you're using whole barrels, right? So you have to like balance the blend. It's like, okay, now it's going to have to be three of these barrels to one of these barrels to one of these barrels, or no, it's these barrels are getting too much age on them. I'm going to have to do two and then one and then one, you know, past that, right? And mm-hmm. um, I like the, like I said, I like the chess game of it a lot. Yeah. Um. It's a lot of um, seeing into the past and planning your future. Yes. And it takes a very special awareness to be able to do that. Yes. You know, when I'm I'm not doing as much blending with finished product in my career anymore, what I do is just operations-based. I'm, I'm trying to pump out as much new make whiskey and fill as many barrels as I possibly can. So my forecasting is how much grain do I have? How much yeast <laughs> yes. do I have? Yes. How many fermenters do I have available? How many shifts do I need to run? How many distillers do I need to have? And it's just a different kind of chess game. That's really what the distilled spirits industry is, is you're moving a lot of different working parts. Yes. Yes. It's so different than any other kind of manufacturing, too, because like you said, it's based on agriculture. Mm -hmm. It's based on supply chain. It's based on flavor profiles that you just don't even know when you're distilling every day and you're working through all of your things. Ultimately, too, it's like, okay, you've got the staff, you've got the corn, you've got the you know, you've got all the things lined up, but that day you don't exactly know what the distill is going to taste like. No. And that's, I think, what makes craft distilling so much fun is that we can try and keep it as consistent as humanly possible. But you'll see some small irregularities with each distillation and it makes it fun. It yes. keeps it interesting. Yes, it does. But true consistency is so hard to do with a, a craft operation that's doing batch distillation yes. that does one distillation at a time. Versus your large producers that do continuous distillation. Yes, yes. Now, in your blending career, have you found that the whiskey that you're working with as a whole is changing? Because this is something that I've heard oh, from yes. a lot of people. You know, yes, whiskey is getting younger. Um, the blends are changing. Um, it's tasting harsher. Does global warming have anything to do with that, with how these barrels are aging? So what have you kind of observed um, with whiskey as a whole in term, uh, from a blender's perspective? Um, absolutely those things, right? I mean, you know, the older barrels, it, there's a re- reason they get a reputation for being better barrels. Not that there's not some really spectacular two-year-old whiskey out there, mm-hmm. but, you know, you start to trace back and um, the things you have to overcome, you start to look at the old barrel wood and the rings are all tighter. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So the wood doesn't taste the same that it does now. There's no way for a um, 
Cooper to actually duplicate what happened because the wood's coming out of the forest a little bit different, right? Um, some of the auto, it, nothing's auto. I, what I love about Cooper is the fact that it's still so old school meets, meets you know, meets high tech, right? It's so amazing. But, um, um, you know, but through that process, you're, you know, people are streamlined it a little bit better, right? You know, so, it, it, you know, I know that we're shifting some of the flavors there. Um, the corn's changed, right? You look at pre-prohibition corn versus post-prohibition. It's when hybrids started coming, you know, uh, on strong, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely some differences in that. Um, there's a very famous whiskey that even in the first early years when I was distilling for Steve Beam, when I first got to Kentucky, you know, drinking it, it's like rich and a little bit caramely and everything. And then I remember he and I went to like an economic development meeting. It's like three years later. And we look at each other across the room because we're tasting the same whiskey. It's like, wow, I wouldn't have recognized this. Yeah. Right. I didn't have any idea that this was the same whiskey, but they were using some, because of the boom, right? They were using some really old stocks in some of those first blends. And then they're going to have, they started pushing the number back, you know, mm -hmm. I don't mean to call them out, but like Jim Beam Black, eight year, I used to love that stuff. Right. And I still like it. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I still hoarding a couple bottles with the age statement still on the front of them because it was, you know, eight to who knows how old that whiskey was oh, in that sure. bottle, right? Yeah. But as the popularity, you know, took off, right? And then they had to drop the, you know, there's other famous brands too, where the age shape was on the front, then it went to the back label, and then it fell off the back label, mm -hmm. you know? So there's certainly from a consumer standpoint, you know, there's a difference um, just because those, you know, large stocks of older barrels just aren't available anymore. Yeah. From a blending standpoint, how do you work around these challenges? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so high roll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. So so the craziest blending project I did, um, I got asked to have my passport, go to a town and or a city, and I got there and they're like, We need you to fly to Canada. Uh, there was a mistake made and um somebody accidentally sent our two tankers of whiskey out. And now they don't have them anymore. And here we've got these sample bottles. So we want you to go to Canada and match these sample bottles, right? For a second, I got really worried that you said that the whiskey got stuck at the Canadian border because <laughs> shipping <laughs> alcohol to and from Canada is so hard to <laughs> do. Yes, There's so much. I know. You think it's the easiest way to not. It's not. There's so much regulation involved. Yes. And there's so yes. many like fines if you get it wrong. I was like, oh my God, Lisa, don't tell me that the Canadian <laughs> government seized your whiskey and no, you have to go no. like steal it back from them. Yeah. But I, so I ended up going to this like basically, you know, like um, lab that's not mar a huge building, right? Mm -hmm. So because they're in bulk whiskey, right? And so it's an enormous building. I have a translator because the, the person in the lab only spoke French, right? And I worked for two days um, on those whiskeys, but it was so fascinating between because a lot of that whiskey was super young. So it was a really, it was intense and short, but it was a very good learning experience because uh, there I was able to use some other things out of the cabinets, right? But to be able to pull those in and soften the edges. And so when I got back up to this day, I still don't know where that whiskey went. I don't label it went under. I had no idea. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> No idea to this day. Um, but I came back with that same philosophy. And that's when I started dividing barrels out, right? And not using a whole barrel sometimes because I could soften the edges of some of those younger, wilder whiskeys um, with some of the older stuff. Mm -hmm. that's it so it did take a lot. Yeah. And in Canada, I mean, you can actually pull in, like if you're doing a sherry finished product, you can actually use yes. some yes. sherry and yes. dose it. Yes. And that must have been so much fun painting with all of those colors. It was, it was, it was nerve wracking a little bit because I had to match before, you know, at the end of my 48 hours, I had to match. Oh, you were given 48 hours. Well, I could have probably stayed longer. I was trying to get done. Right. But um, yeah, yeah, I had to. Anyway, it's like a very <laughs> high stakes game show. Yes. And the clock is ticking down. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Oh man. That's that's really intense though. Yeah, but it was only because that mistake had been made, right? You know, yeah. so yeah. They just needed to get them matched up and send them out. But did they ever find where the missing I, I I was off the radar. They they fingerprinted me and took my picture and I went in there and worked and it was all it was all You made whiskey for spies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just for spies. Yeah. It was all off the right. I mean 
I I went to lunch with the translator and we talked about real estate in Canada, I think, or something weird. And and but no, I really didn't have a conversation with anyone while I was there. And then I left. And uh, yeah. So what company am I working for? How do you like your salad? <laughs> no, but like, what company am I working for? I got chicken in my food. Did, are you? Did you get chicken as well? Is that kind of? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I didn't even ask. I knew not to ask, right? Because I knew when I got fingerprinted and had to sign the thing to say that anything that I saw or did while I was there was like, you know. Yeah. Okay. So I had to be generic. I mean, that's the reason I'm not even tell you what I did to this stuff. But yeah, it was fascinating. That's fa- magic. But I took it, brought it back. It's like, yeah. oh, right. The light bulb went off. It's like, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because these things that were a little bit thinner and a little more astringent. It's like, oh, yeah, there's ways to round this off yeah. without using having to have a whole huge stock of older stuff. So essentially, whiskey has changed, but mm-hmm. it's not necessarily for the worst. No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Because I, I'm kind of of the opinion that we're distilling so much right now. And we finally hit that point after the great bourbon boom. As 2014, I think, is when we filled a similar number of barrels to what we did in 1964. We're finally getting to the point where, like, those barrels are of age. And I think we're going to have so much really cool whiskey on the market. Yes, soon. exactly. It's not so now. much more is being produced. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm really interested to see what people like you are going to be making um, in terms of these really cool blends coming down the road. Yeah. And I think the base whiskeys that are, that you know, the, the, the white spirits that I've tasted in judging things over the last few years, they're improving every year. Mm-hmm. Every year, the base whiskeys are improving. Yeah. I think it's a rising tides, mm-hmm. raises all shifts yes. type yes. of thing. I think the industry is just getting better as a whole in terms of what it's producing. There's so much attention on distilling now. Uh, there is more resources being thrown into distilling now. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see kind of what comes up. Yeah, we've got so many varied cooperages, you know, we've got the gold standards, you know, and the and the things that we're used to using cooperage wise, but there's so many other people coming on strong as well. For sure. You know, so it's all going to bring something to the table that's a little bit different. Yeah. So looking into the future, what are some of the kind of fun things that are on your horizon? Or what are you hoping to do? Um, in my near future, um, I'm hoping to get my truck tuned up and get on the road and visit a lot of people that have extended invitations to me. And over the years, I've been crazy busy and haven't been able to take those opportunities. Um, So I'm going to go um, start a little bit in Kentucky and then head north a little bit and start heading east and visit some people and um, see what I can, you know, it's time to learn again right now. Yeah. There's so much to learn. What In particular, are you looking to see on the East Coast? Is there any like distilling trends that you're really interested in out there? Um, Actually, I'm going to visit people more than the distilling trends. And then, yeah, and just see what they're doing, right? And figure that out. I'm um, the Our Whiskey Foundation. I'm mentoring a young woman in, um, I shouldn't say young, she's a woman, um, in (laughs) Asbury Park, New Jersey. So I'm going to go out and see Kelly, right? And, um, but I want to go back and, you know, see the Widow Jane crew. And I've got some other distillers in, in New York that, I've spent some time with and I'm going to go back and see them as well. So yeah, for the near future, the itinerant distiller thing is going to be truthful until I can figure out what's next for me because I am um, currently unemployed <laughs> and looking to see what's next and actually really excited, kind of relieved yeah, um, and very excited about what's next. But I don't know what that looks like yet. So I'm really excited for you. Um, I think this next chapter is going to be really incredible. You've built such an amazing reputation in this industry. We all know you. We all love you. Um, Thank you, Sydney. And you're going to do such amazing things. I'm thrilled that I just get to watch it, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, we overlap, so you're not going to just watch. (laughs) You know, I think, like you said, right? you know, rising tide lifts all ships. So, I, you know, I... I appreciate this industry so much and people have been so amazing. I mean, they're always amazing, but the last few weeks have been a little bit tricky and difficult and um, people have just been, I mean, I'm so fortunate. I'm so lucky. Uh, you know, part of what I let it, love about this industry so much is the camaraderie and the friendships and um, people have got my back. Yeah. It's a small industry. Mm-hmm. We we know. Yes, we, we know. know. <laughs> 
We love each other. We take care of each other. We look out for each other, um, which is why I love the work that you do with our Whiskey Foundation. Um, if you guys are unaware of our Whiskey, can you kind of describe what that foundation is and what they do? Yeah, Becky Paskinch uh, founded. I actually met Becky. I spoke at the World Whiskey Forum in the Cotswolds. Oh my gosh, how many years ago? Five, six years ago. Sounds about right. And so I met um, Becky and Georgie Bell that you know, when I was there, and they were awesome and so passionate about breaking some of the stereotypes, gosh, that's a cliche things to say, but, you know, breaking some of the stereotypes about what a whiskey drinker, you know, of course, we all have our worst stories, you know, about somebody passing us up. I actually have a few story. So I moved to Brooklyn, I'm in a uh, whiskey bar, Mm -hmm. and I order a few rye, and I... They put the whiskey down in front of me. I'm like, well, this is really good. It's few, but it's bourbon. It's not rye. And she's looking at me like this middle-aged woman, right? How dare <laughs> she? <laughs> woman, like, how dare she? And surely, you know, like, how does she know anything? I never did the whole time I was there ever say what I did, right? Mm-hmm. And for a living, I see her go back to the bartender and he's mad. You can tell he's pointing one way, like that bourbon's that way and the rye's all down this way, right? But she even charged me for it <laughs> It was delicious. It was few, but it was, you know, it was not what I had asked for. So, you know, we all have those war stories. That was actually another, you know, woman serving, but it was the fact that there was no no recognition that maybe I did know that my difference in my whiskeys, right? Mm-hmm. And not that I was trying to impress anybody, but she'd brought me the wrong thing, right? So, uh, but Becky was working very hard on all of that sort of um, marketing and programming. Um, she's best known for calling out, um, you know, a very famous, well-known to just review whiskey writer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And on uh, some of the um, really unfortunate overtones in some of his writing and how he was explaining some of his reviews when it was just not necessary. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, she had already done such great things, but she really took a risk for all of us mm-hmm. to do that. And she did get a lot of backlash out of it, you know, and she stood strong and, um, straightened her spine and lifted her chin and said, you know, I'm holding steady here. But so she's ex- developed her programming. So it's pretty remarkable. So now there's doing a program, you know, where you, she's matching mentees, which I met Taurus. And um, I'm learning as much from Kelly as I, I hope I'm teaching her as much as I'm learning from her. So. Yeah, it's such a great thing. You know, I still have these weird interactions all the time. Like I'm in Bardstown and there are um, like female distillers are not a weird thing here, but I was in a liquor store and a man was like, well, what kind of whiskey do you like? I'm like, well, I like this and this. And, you know, I, I also like what I make. Ha ha. <laughs> I guess that's kind of what I have to say. And I do really like what I, I make. And he's like, oh, you know, women are just doing so much in whiskey nowadays. I'm like, well, we've been doing a lot in yes. whiskey for a long time. It's just, we're now getting attention for it. You know. Yeah, you look at the history of it, and women have been in distilling since the beginning of time. And Kentucky distilling is not any different than that, right? You know, women were um, better bottlers; they put the labels on straighter, right? Mm-hmm. They they were neater and tidier, and better um, handwriting, better handwriting, all the things, right? And so, women have been around for a long time. You know, there were some really stupid, horrible things that kept women off plant floors um, because um, they, you know, it was really awful. But it's like, well, you know. Men like me might look up their skirts if they're on a ladder, kind of stuff, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I know, I know. And I learned that actually from my mentor. He told me some of those stories, right? But um, that makes but women fan. were still in whiskey during that time, though. Even if they weren't on the plant for or in production, they were still, um, you know, in the offices. I can tell. I've got a lot of old. I've collected some old distillery records, you know, and it's women signing off on the bottom of the distillery records and mm-hmm. the record keeping. We've always had a place here mm-hmm. and it feels very special to be um, in this industry at time at, at a time like now where you are doing such incredible things and also giving back to this community. And it also feels really great that we're having this conversation at the end of Women's History Month yes. um, in March. Uh, it just feels very uh, serendipitous and special. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to uh, speak with me uh imparting all of this really cool wisdom uh before we sign off is there any uh advice that you would give to um other young female distillers that are looking to enter into the market as we round out women's history month 
I actually wrote this a few years ago when somebody asked me to write, you know, something. It was just a few words and I had to think about it. And it's maybe overly simplistic, but I have been, you know, I've had incredible highs in this industry, but, you know, you can't balance incredible highs with some without having some lows, right? But it's like when you find your gift, right, in distilling, wherever that is, right, whether that's in the quality lab or whether that's on the plant floor or whether that's in marketing or being an ambassador or whatever you are, but find your gift and you work really hard with it. And the other thing is that's still not enough. You just don't give up. Yeah. You don't give up. If it's, you're not in the right space or the right place, um, somebody will either make that decision for you or you'll make it for yourself. And it doesn't mean you're done. It means you just keep going because there's something else out there because, you know, this this business is a gift. And if you've, you've figured out where your gift is and it fix, fits in, just don't give up. Exactly. Yeah. And then work really hard with it because, you know, you got to put in the work. Yeah. And Lisa and I are both kind of examples that you do not need an engineering or a chemistry background <laughs> right <laughs> to be working in this industry yes. you can stumble your way in yes and you will be just fine yes you will yes you will <laughs> well lisa thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me tonight i've loved spending time with you in bardstown uh thank you for listening to this latest episode of the craft spirits and distilling podcast Uh, Super happy to have you guys tune in. Listen to us next time uh, with either myself or with Molly as we continue interviewing really outstanding distillers and learning more about their processes. Experience the convenience of working with one vendor, one source for all of your craft business needs. Visit lotusbevalliance.com today. Visit countrymalt.com slash distilling to view their complete list of distilling products, resources, and podcast episodes. And visit craftederp.com to learn how Crafted meets your business needs where you are today and prepares you for everything that's coming tomorrow. craftederp.com. Visit technoblend.com today to discover how their innovative solutions can redefine the art of distillation. If you've enjoyed this podcast, go to spiritsanddistilling.com and sign up for our free newsletter featuring news stories every week from some of the best writers and distillers in the distilling world. For all information about Lisa and what she's currently up to, you can find her on Instagram at lbwicker, L-B-W-I-C-K-E-R. We'll be back in two weeks with another in-depth distilling conversation for you. Thanks for joining us. This podcast has been brought to you by Craft Spirits and Distilling for those who love to make and drink great spirits. Join our free newsletter today at spiritsanddistilling.com for pragmatic, technical, and creative distilling stories in your inbox every week. Sign up now at spiritsanddistilling.com or click on the link in the show notes.